Good afternoon. I'm Abby Wolf, the Executive Director of the Hutchins Center, and on behalf of Professor Gates and all of us here, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this virtual space for Jean Jarrett's lecture today. One housekeeping item, please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please keep them brief so that we can get to as many as possible. We're certain we'll have a lot. Now it's my pleasure to say my pleasure to say a few words about Robin Bernstein, who will in, introduce Dean Jarrett's lecture this afternoon. Robin Bernstein is Dillon Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality here at Harvard. She is a cultural historian who specializes in U.S. racial formation from the 19th century to the present. She holds a PhD in American Studies from Yale University and is an elected member of the American Antiquarian Society. Professor Bernstein's 2011 book, Racial Innocence, Performing American Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights, won a stunning five awards. Daphne Brooks, who was a previous lecturer in this virtual series, wrote of racial innocence through imaginative and masterfully innovative archival research Bernstein shows how representations of childhood and child's play are integral to the making of whiteness and blackness and citizenship in this country. Professor Bernstein is also the editor of the anthology Cast Out Queer Lives in Theater and a Jewish feminist children's book, Terrible, Terrible. In 2018, she published a previously unavailable slave narrative of Jane Clark in the journal Commonplace. And in academic year 2018 and 19, she held a Radcliffe Fellowship and has also served as chair of Harvard's WGS program. Anyone who has heard Professor Bernstein lecture knows what a dynamic and engaged teacher she is. And her truly stellar teaching and mentoring have been rewarded at Harvard with two distinguished awards. From 2018 through 2023, she is a Harvard College professor, which recognizes particularly distinguished contributions to undergraduate teaching and to creating a positive influence in the culture of teaching in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And just this past Friday, she was selected to receive the Everett Mendelssohn Excellence in Mentoring Award from the Graduate Students of Arts and Sciences Student Council here at Harvard. Congratulations, Robin. In 2017, Professor Bernstein's column, The Art of No, was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education in which she gave tips about how academics could fruitfully say no to certain requests. But we are so glad that she decided to say yes to us today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robin Bernstein this afternoon. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Abby. That was, that was such a kind and generous introduction. Um, it, is, um, it is an honor now for me to introduce to you um, Andrew Jean Jarrett. Uh, he is the Cyril Kushner Dean of the College of Arts and Science and Professor of English at New York University. A distinguished scholar of African-American literary history from the 18th century to the present, Dean Jarrett has won fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies and from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Before he came to NYU, Dean Jarrett was, uh, spent a decade at Boston University, where he served as acting director of the program in African American Studies, chair of the Department of English, and associate dean of the Faculty for the Humanities. And prior to that, he was a professor of English at the University of Maryland, which is one of my alma maters. Dean Jarrett has also served as elected chair of the American Literature Section of the Modern Language Association, and he is the author of two scholarly books and the editor of eight books on African-American literature and literary criticism. He is the founding editor-in-chief of the African-American Studies module for Oxford Bibliographies Online, published by Oxford University Press. Dean Jarrett recently completed a comprehensive biography of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the first African-American professional writer born after slavery. In this book, forthcoming from Princeton University Press, Jarrett tells a comprehensive yet intimate story of an African-American in Dunbar who wrestled with the constraints of Gilded Age America, yet who sought to express or mitigate this strife through the written and spoken word. His talk today derives from that exciting project. 
please join me in welcoming Dean Jean Andrew Jarrett. Thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen right now. I hope this is clear. Thank you, Professor uh, Robin Bernstein for uh, such a gracious introduction. First of all, above all, I'd like to thank Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. for inviting me to deliver one of the W.E.B. Du Bois lectures at Harvard. Your longtime leadership of the Hutchins Center for African American Research at Harvard has demonstrated the importance of bringing people together to exchange intellectual ideas on the African diaspora. Through research, the center has provided a crucial foundation on which scholars and teachers, students and the broader public can learn more about how racial, cultural, and political experiences have defined the history and advanced the progress of humanity around the world. The scholarly work of past Du Bois speakers have touched on these principles and informed my own work and their consistent service to higher education I've long admired. I'm honored now to be a part of this remarkable class of colleagues. Once again, thank you as well as your staff and colleagues in ensuring my ability to participate in this event despite the societal challenges of the pandemic last year and this year. And I would like to thank all of the viewers of this program who are here in real time or plan to view this recording later asynchronously. As mentioned, I completed writing my third book, a biography of the legendary African-American poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, forthcoming from Princeton University Press next year, coinciding with the 150th anniversary of Dunbar's birth, given that he was born in 1872. We anticipate that there will be wide public discussion, if not also celebration of Dunbar's life, literature, and legacy. I hope that my biography will play a crucial role in informing and shaping this conversation. Mine resembles the lengthy, detailed, and comprehensive biographies published previously on African-American writers and intellectuals whose lives span the 19th and or 20th century. Some examples include most recently the biographies by David Blight on Frederick Douglass or Jeffrey Stewart on Elaine Locke, or a while back by Arnold Rampersand on Langston Hughes, David Levering Lewis on Du Bois, or Lois Brown on Paul Pauline Hopkins. I can only hope that my biography of Dunbar can even touch the hem of success that these biographies have achieved. Some of these biographers I have personally spoken to about the art and science of biography and about their own work in the course of writing my book. And I'd like to express gratitude to them here. For the purpose of this event, my lecture divides into two parts. The first part explains the general thrusts of my biography and the scale of Dunbar's historical importance and impact. The second part draws upon a section where I describe the boyhood relationship of Dunbar with Orville Wright, who should sound familiar to many of you as one of the famed co-inventors of the first airplane that could, that could achieve controlled, sustained, and powered flight. Orville also turned out to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial printer who teamed up with Dunbar on, per, on behalf of circulating a newspaper to the black community of Dayton, Ohio. I suppose the compelling story is that two boys, one black and one white, one an aspiring poet and the other an aspiring aviator for a brief period came together against the backdrop of Jim Crow racial segregation to better the lives of African-American readers prior to drifting apart to impact the world in distinct ways. Sometimes I wonder what would their lives have become and what would our own world be today if they had never linked up with one another? The last thing I will say before reading these two sections is that writing the biography was not without its challenges. Some difficulties include the process of selecting the most relevant details for biographical inclusion, overcoming the practical limits suffered by the African-American archive during the era and aftermath of slavery, cutting through the myths of his celebrity to the facts of his life and capturing the formal and thematic essence of his writings despite how numerous, dispersed and sensationalized their publications were. Perhaps the greatest challenge was documenting only the portion of the literature, life and legacy of his wife, whose maiden name was Alice Ruth Moore that revolved around Paul's experience, experiences. Even though recent scholarly interest, including my own, 
in her historical significance and literary accomplishments continues to grow. And even though she deserves her own independent biography, one comprehensive enough to tell her life story in all its complexity, wonder, and inspiration. I describe these largely academic issues in an epilogue to my biography where you can learn more about them. So now let's begin. In the October 1914 issue of the AME Review, an author named Alice M. Dunbar published The Poet and His Song, reflecting on the life and character of her former husband, the legendary African-American poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. When they first corresponded in April 1895, she went by the full name of Alice Ruth Moore. She was 19 years old, he 22. Close to two years, their epistolary courtship lasted until they became engaged in early February 1897. Little over one year later, in March 1898, they married. And in January 1902, they separated abruptly without having had children as a couple. Despite his pleas of forgiveness, which she unfailingly ignored, they never reunited. In print and person alike, turbulence described the six years and nine months of their relationship, infatuation and love, admiration and encouragement, but also suspicion and frustration, exasperation and fury, as well as intimidation and violence. Even though Alice published The Poet and His Song nine years after Paul's death, she retained the surname Dunbar. In fact, the essay marked her first ever published study of why Paul perceived the world the way he did. So if one wishes to get a correct idea of any poet whatever, she explains at the outset, he must delve beneath the mere sordid facts of life and its happenings, of the so many volumes published in such and such a time, of the influence upon him of this or that author of school of poetry, of the, of the friends who took up his time or gave him inspiration, and above all, one must seek what the love of nature has done for the poet. Alice's essay seeks to render more human, if more profound and complex, a person she once loved but later came to resent during his lifetime, and after his death, a person she had eventually come to appreciate in retrospect. The title Poet Laureate of His Race, which Paul assumed during the height of his professional career, underestimated the formal and thematic complexity of his poetry. In lyrical prose, Alice describes the poems Paul wrote that best mirrored his unique literary sensibility. One of these poems was Sympathy, published in his fourth book of poetry, Lyrics of the Earth Side, published in 1899. I know what the cage bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opes and the faint perfume from its chalice steals, I know what the cage bird feels. I know why the cage bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bow a swing. And pain still throbs in the old, old scars and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the cage bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is of a, not of a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the cage bird sings. The bird's cage, according to Alice, actually referred to the iron grating of the book stacks of the Library of Congress, where the torrid sun poured its rays down into the courtyard of the library and heated the iron grilling of the book stacks until they were like prison bars in more senses than one, she wrote. Paul worked at the Library of Congress indeed from September 1897 through October 1898. During this period, a series of illnesses cut short his employment there. What had initially been the proverbial job to die for turned into a job which was killing his body and spirit. Being, quote, a poet shut up in an iron cage with medical works was ironic incongruity, Alice wrote. Among the stacks, Paul was not a patron, but a prisoner. Now he quote, understood 
how the bird felt when it beat its wings against its cage, close quote. More than a biographical clue to Paul's stint at the Library of Congress, the poem Sympathy represents a broader existential testimony to the miraculous and transcendent bond between the poet and the world. The poem highlights the direct ratio of the poet to sympathy, to the knowledge, as the poem speaker puts it, of three refrains, what the cage bird feels, why the cage bird beats his wing, and why the cage bird sings. Paul indeed struggled with the belief that he lived and wrote like a bird trapped in a cage, however gilded it might have been by the acclaim of admirers. Prodigious and prolific, Paul was a serious professional writer for a total of 16 years, from 1888 until his death. During his time, this time, he released 14 books of poetry, four collections of short stories, and four novels, a body of work that showcased his, showcased his mastery of literary genres, the Western lyric, the romantic poets of England, the schoolroom poets of America, the realism and naturalism of American fiction, the racial uplift of African-American literature, and the dialect of informal English. Newspapers and magazines across the country syndicated many of the individual texts in his 18 books of poems and short stories. Across various mainstream and obscure periodicals, he also published essays on the progress, productivity, and challenges of African-Americans including himself, for which the achievements of his literature and life, fairly or not, served as his societal benchmarks from the dawn of their enslavement to their newfound franchise and freedom in the decades after the Civil War. To wide acclaim, he recited his poems or delivered speeches in private homes, churches, schools, and auditoriums across America's East Coast and Midwest, as well as the cities of England. And he drafted experimental works, including librettos and drama that exhibited his, his promising artistic versatility. The quality, breadth, and diversity of his literature especially inspired countless people around the world. A biography of Dunbar, however, cannot merely be a story of the intellectual ideas that informed the way he wrote literature, nor can it be only an exploration of the mental, emotional, and moral compass by which he oriented himself in the world. It must also recount the wider historical forces that inevitably shaped his personality, the forces that guided the various personal and professional choices that lay before him and that he believed would determine the course of his life, career, and legacy. One must tell the full yet intimate story of an African American who wrestled with the constraints of America in the Gilded Age, but who also sought to express or mitigate this strife through the written and spoken word. Reared during and after Reconstruction, Paul belonged to a generation of African Americans, of so-called new Negroes whose parents were slaves and who were adjusting to the capitalist modernity of America. It was a time when, quote unquote, the man of letters had to become, quote unquote, a man of business, as William Dean Howells, the so-called Dean of American Letters, a renowned critic and writer who had become one of Amer Paul's most influential patrons, acknowledged in 1893. Quote, unless he sells his art, he cannot live, that society will leave him to starve if he does not hit its fancy in a picture or a poem or a statue. And all this is bitterly true, close quote. But it also was a time when such an edict leaned on an expectation that African-Americans who sought to make a living through writing literature had to tailor it to racial stereotypes. Professional opportunities for such writers were limited to certain types of writing, including the depiction of undereducated dialect or African Americans in the racist mold of blackface minstrelsy. The commercial world troubled Paul, even as he ironically excelled in it, unlike any other African American writer before and including his time. To make proper sense of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, one has to begin his story well before his birth on June 27, 1872. One must understand the antebellum lives of his parents, Joshua Dunbar and Matilda Murphy, as Kentucky slaves, their separate experiences during the Civil War, their acculturation to post-war city, to the post-war city in Dayton, Ohio, where Paul was born, and their combustible marriage, violent exchanges, and eventual divorce. 
As Paul matured, he, he came to embody contradictions while rebelling against the world's stifling expectations. He tried to be a faithful boyfriend or husband to women, but his wandering eyes betrayed his pleas of fidelity. Alcoholism afflicted his father and eventually overtook him too to the horror or fascination of sober onlookers. Paul enjoyed reading, writing, and reciting literature in formal English, but the commercial vogue for the persona and dialect of the so-called old Negro or of the undereducated docile slave pressured him at times to change course to improve the sales of his published literature. Racial politics divided the African-American intelligentsia into the partisan camps either supportive or critical of the industrial ethos of the most famous African-American educator of the, at the turn of the 20th century, Booker T. Washington. As Paul's perspective on racial progress evolved, he would come publicly to support both camps at different times. Under such duress, the conflicted dimensions of Paul's personality became more manifest. He was a temperamental judge of others' failings, yet he himself was insecure. Toward the patrons of the white literati, he was obsequious, yet with the patriarchs of the black intelligentsia, he ingratiated himself. And to the multiple women he wrote intimate let to, to whom he wrote intimate letters that ultimately ultimately expressed extremes of excessive love and merciless condemnation. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the first African American writer born after slavery, that is, the first modern African American writer to achieve commercial prosperity and international stature exclusively by his literary pen. But he was not just a writer of literature. Although merely an occasional librettist and lyricist for musicals, he also came, he became crucial to two unprecedented milestones in the history of American culture. He wrote the libretto for the first musical with a full African-American cast to appear on Broadway, a one-act show called Clorindy, The Origin of the Cakewalk, which premiered in 1898. And he penned the lyrics for In Dahomey, which debuted in 1902 as the full, first full-length Broadway musical to be both written and performed by African-Americans. Despite these accomplishments, the blessing and curse of Paul's celebrity status compelled him to behave in extreme or unpredictable ways, ranging from his poised and gentlemanly decorum during his trip to England to the shameful misbehavior in, to repeat Alice Ruth Moore's lament, the mere sordid facts or of life and its happenings. Like a poem, the essential meaning of Paul's life and literature defies easy paraphrase. The next section of my lecture will focus on the entrepreneurial and personal bond between Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Orville Wright. Both were high school classmates in Dayton, Ohio, and I trace how their lives intertwined and the circumstances of race and newspaper culture under which they lived in the Midwest. Please note that I will, what I read is a distilling of two detailed chapters. To ensure in our time frame that I can stay on the through line of the story of Paul and Orville, I have cut out a number of sections. These sections include the detailed discussions of the history of racial segregation and desegregation in Ohio, Paul's time in intermediate school in his early teenage years, the classical curriculum and liberal arts education he enjoyed in Dayton schools, his academic performance there, including his grades, and further background on the culture of Midwestern newspapers and how Dunbar and Wright families acculturated to them. These and other details you'll just have to read in the biography itself when it appears in print, as they say. Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Orville Wright's bond may have been preordained. Orville's father, a United Brethren Church clergyman, had married Paul's parents, Joshua and Matilda Dunbar, two former Kentucky slaves on Christmas Eve in 1871. Nearly two decades later, both Paul and Orville had enrolled in Dayton Central High School. Initially in the class of 1890, they became entrepreneurial partners in a short-lived newspaper called the Dayton Tatler. They genuinely respected each other. In the back room of the right and right print shop, co-run by Orville and his brother Wilbur and located on the second floor of a building on the corner of West Third and William Street in West Dayton. Paul reportedly scrawled on a wall, Orville Wright is out of sight in the printing business. No other mind is half as bright as his is. 
or his own is. During Paul's years before the Tatler, he was refining his reading and writing of poems with the help of committed teachers in intermediate school and of classical curricula in high school, although he needed several years to mature into an excellent student in the classroom. These years comprise a period of personal struggle and self-inquiry. Paul grappled with his father's troubled legacy for him and the rest of his family. His father, Joshua Dunbar, was an alcoholic and abandoned his family. And Paul sought to articulate his memories and imaginings in his early fiction, poetry, and drama. Jim Crow racial segregation was not yet officially dismantled right after Paul graduated from district school. It normally kept students black and white like him and Orville apart. Yet they were close friends, Orville himself later reflected, quote, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the Negro poet, and I were close friends in our school days and in the years immediately following. When he was 18 and I 19, we published a five column weekly paper for people of his race, close quote. The improbable publication by two young men, one black, the other white, of a periodical for the African-American readers of Dayton was the remarkable backdrop to Paul's transformation into a professional writer. From being the early performer of literature one Easter Sunday in 1884, which was his first significant public recital, to an experienced writer and editor by 1891. Paul's high school years encompassed the story of how two boys discovered common ground across the so-called color line, not merely within high school classrooms where curricula forced them to learn the same lessons, but outside them where newspapers instilled a shared sense of fascination. For Paul, the allure was literary. He was drawn to honing further his exceptional skills of editing and creative writing, the ones that in a few years would elevate his poetry to international prominence. For Orville, the attraction was managerial. As much as he wished to help advance the mission of the Dayton Tatler to provide, quote, all the news among the colored people, close quote, in the words of one motto, he also wanted more business for the fledgling printing press that he and his brother Wilbur co-founded. And that helped sharpen the organizational acumen they would bring to aviation in a new century. Paul's union with Orville closed a chapter of his life as grand for its achievement as for his gateway to literary self-expression. By the time he graduated from Central High School, Paul was poised to learn from these experiences and experiments and to make a crucial pivot. Prepare to cast our moorings free, he wrote as a pointed class poet in his farewell song to his high school commencement audience and breast the waves of future's sea. Close quote. When Paul matriculated at Dayton Central High School in fall 1886, he would be shaped not only by his education inside Central High School, but also by the changes outside it, namely to those to public education in Dayton and broader Ohio. By that time, the city's gradual racial desegregation policies aligned with those of a little more than half of the cities in Ohio. This history may be broken into four periods. The period before circa 1848, prior to the permission of African Americans to public education. The brief period from 1848 until 1853, the period before colored schools fell within the jurisdiction of larger boards of education. The longer overlapping period between 1848 and 1887, when colored schools were up and running, but under racially segregated circumstances. And afterward, when such ost ostensibly racial districting officially stopped. After 1887, the advanced alignment of de facto and de jure racial integration benefited Dayton. Public opinion here indicated that whites were quite prepared for the racial integration of schools, even as African Americans grappled with the division within, within their own communities over the issue. The existence of only one high school in Dayton when Paul was enrolled mooted the need to segregate schools at that level. Local school boards here and elsewhere in Northern states did exploit one last loophole, racially segregating classrooms within racially mixed schools so as to avoid displaying any open defiance of state law. The Dayton school boards established separate classrooms for black children in, in mixed schools in 1912, legal scholar Davidson Douglas wrote, a practice that had used in the 19th century. 
Other cities in Ohio, Springfield's take one, likewise segregated African-American students within racially mixed schools. No evidence indicates that Paul, as he turned 15 and entered the 10th grade, a mere seven months after statewide desegregation, was at all separated from his classmates at Central High School. In an official school photograph, as you see here, he stands alongside the classmates of his initial cohort, class of 1890, albeit he stands rather aloof. All things considered, his memory of Central High School turned out to be favorable. He was the only African-American in his class, yet fellow boys were kind to him, he stated later in life. He also befriended and collaborated with a young white man, the one in the rear, standing before the central doorway in the class photograph, whose own zeal for technological innovation would soon reach historic proportions. Until then, the partnership between the two became one of the more fascinating legends of Dayton. In June 18, 69, the family of Milton Wright made the first of several interstate moves that would typify its itineracy for the next decade and a half. The Klan moved from Indiana in which Milton was born and raised and became an ordained minister in the United Brethren Church and in which his future wife, Susan, attended Hartsfield College in a United Brethren school where she and Milton met in 1853. After getting married six years later, they started having children, most pertinently Wilbur in 1867 and Orville in 1871. For most of his adult life, Milton served the United Brethren Church with almost all his energies. The church established in Maryland in 1800 was profoundly democratic and individualistic in perspective, as well as devoutly egalitarian in pietism, even as it subscribed to a hierarchical governance of an elder, bishops, clerical delegates, ministers, and regional conferences. Specific principles distinguished the church. It opposed secret Masonic societies. It deplored alcoholism. It was decidedly anti-slavery. And during the Civil War, it supported the Union. The church's moral and political stances appealed to Milton. By 1871, he had been a pastor and presiding elder in the White River Conference of the Church of the United Brethren. In this year, he was elected editor of the Religious Telescope, the weekly newspaper of the United Brethren Church in Dayton, a central region for the religious publications, incidentally. Although he did not ascend to bishop in 1877, until 1877, his election to the editorship paved the way. Editorship granted him stature and influence as he espoused the reconstruction laws and policies supporting the franchise of African-Americans. He cultivated a home in which his family appreciated the ethical and political causes of their era. Church and editorial businesses forced Milton to shuttle his family across Iowa, Iowa, Ohio, Iowa, and Indiana and to place his boys in a number of different regional schools. Still, the attachment of the rights to West Dayton was unwavering. After years of traveling, during which time they rented their Hawthorne house, the family resettled there in 1884. By the end of this sojourn, Wilbur and Orville were 17 and 13, respectively. Despite the family size, the Bishop's boys, Wilbur and Orville, the third and sixth born of seven children, emerged as the most active rights in Dayton lore. With their eventual invention of the airplane, they would also become the most celebrated. From the home, Milton would, from the home Milton came and went, attending to church and editorial business, while Susan normally stayed behind. The Wrights were a cerebral family, owing to the intellect of Milton and Susan. Milton became in 1868 the first professor of theology in the United Brethren Church's history. Susan also attended college in Indiana, studying literature and developed expertise in mechanical invention and repair. Almost all of the children learned to read before they even entered school. And Milton criticized Dayton school instructors if he sensed they were failing to teach children up to his own high standards. The children, above all Wilbur, were disciplined, advanced readers and writers, attracted to Milton's large private library and attracted to learning, whether by way of private concentration or public schooling. In the late 1880s, the intellectual tailwind, partly driven by his family that helped 
push Orville through Central High School also naturally steered him toward a friendship with Paul, whose own scholastic momentum made him an ideal entrepreneurial partner. When Paul first began the ninth grade in high school in fall 1886, he was scheduled to graduate four years later by spring 1890, but he delayed his graduation by a year to pursue an extracurricular interest, newspapers. Paul was not alone in viewing Ohio as an especially fertile state for newspaper publication. In 1888, a writer in the renowned Scribner magazine called the Midwest the center of the Republic, a hub of newspaper commerce that served the economic wealth and political influence rising in the old Northwest territory between the Ohio River and the Rocky Mountains. The commercial epicenters of Ohio were Cincinnati and Cleveland. Although paling in comparison to these cities, Dayton joined them in being a node of religious publishing and promising to cultivate its own market of newspapers. Journalism in Dayton began as early as 1808 with the competing Republican and Democratic periodicals. By 1890, the market saw the consolidation of Dayton journalism with papers like the Journal, Her Herald, Morning Times, and Evening News, which all inherited and modified pre-existing local papers. Still, the newspaper was in vogue. The last decade of the 19th century belonged to the era known as more of everything. Readers craved information, whether education or entertainment. Periodicals ranging from newspapers to magazines, from monthlies to weeklies to dailies, captured an interest, according to historian Frank L Luther Mott. As long-standing Dayton newspapers underwent mergers, rebranding, and political realignments during the 19th century, their African-American readership remained small in number and fragile as a literate community. Paul continued to write poems, but mindful of these circumstances, anticipated the need to find places to publish them. The growth of periodicals throughout the country intrigued him. The burgeoning opportunities periodicals offered editors and writers appeal to one Mr. Faber, a Dayton resident and publisher of a newspaper he founded in 1890 called The Democratic. Paul had learned through other local papers of Faber's interest in boosting its circulation, especially among African-American readers. Eventually the two men connected and Paul agreed to help Faber out. Paul also accepted the editor in chiefship of the High School Times, as he put it, the organ of the Philomathian Society of Central High School, as you can see. Faithfully, Paul's turn towards the, the High School Times allowed him to affiliate with a stable paper that offered him not money, but experience and positions of leadership. The opportunities his job as a subscription runner did not provide. He also realized that if he were going to be involved in a newspaper for African-American readers, he might as well publish or edit one himself. Paul's high school classmate came to the rescue. He, uh, he discovered in Orville an ideal companion in print culture, that is in the writing and editing of pieces for newspapers, in the enterprise of printing and circulating them, in the use of them as a vehicle for amplifying an original voice for the good of local readers. Orville happened to be ensconced in the world of newspapers while growing up. His father, Milton, was the editor of the Religious Telescope, a periodical of the, of the United Brethren Printing Establishment from 1871, the year Orville was born, to 1875. One right biographer notes that the enterprise based in Dayton, Ohio, was one of the best equipped religious printing houses in the nation. The Wright family was at the epicenter of the religious printing press enhanced by Milton's ascension to United Brethren Church spokesman as a result of his editorship. Even at an early age, Orville developed a profound attraction to newspapers. In 1881, Milton Wright had become an editorial activist of sorts, publishing reform leaflets and founding the Richmond Star to promote his opposition to secret societies and to, to the liberalization of the United Brethren Church. Orville's older brother, Wilbur, built a contraption for folding the pages of the star from mailing, as well as a six foot treadle powered lathe made out of wood. When the Wrights returned to Dayton permanently, newspapers, or more precisely, the technology of printing held an allure for the Wright brothers. 
Printing so captivated Orville that by the time he entered the ninth grade at Central High School in 1887, classroom education was secondary in his grand scheme of life. Aside from his reputation as a mischievous boy needing a punitive seat in the front of his intermediate school classes, Orville was neither outstanding nor memorable as a student, but he was a close reader of the extensive library that his scholarly parents compiled at home. Along with copies of the Religious Telescope, Reform Leaflets, and the Richmond Star, Milton stacked the shelves with books by Greek philosophers, English historians, French historians, Scottish biographers and novelists, and American writers. The library also included theological, scientific, and encyclopedic texts. If Orville's knowledge of printing was born during his handling of the United Brethren Church leaflets and periodicals, it matured with his combing through one particular book, Cyclopedia or an Universal Dictionary of Arts and Sciences. Published in two volumes in 1728 by Ephraim Chambers, Cyclopedia was a massive book Orville plumbed, plumbed to figure out printing. The second volume of Cyclopedia contained a history of printing, including the distinction between common press print printing for books and rolling press printing, copper plates for pictures, the origin and invention of printing in the West and the modern progress of this industry. Orville learned the role of a compositor, the method of printing and making ink and the components of the printing press. Through the reference work was com Though the reference work was compiled more than a century and a half before he thumbed its pages as a teenager, Orville, along with Wilbur, discovered in it a theoretical blueprint for them to establish their own printing office. Over time, the Wright brothers came to master the rudiments of, printing business, of the printing business. They learned to divide the business into three areas of composing, press room, and warehouse, to enlist the proper personnel and apprenticeship for the jobs to allocate workload and hours to manage the printing process itself, such as typesetting, composition, correcting in metal type, purchasing and preparing paper and ink, and identifying a warehouse to store the newspapers and ready them for delivery. Over time, they would learn the economic risks of printing, such as the engagement of customers, the price of resource, resources and technology, and the scaling of newspaper prices according to supply and demand. Out of the experience of printing short-lived periodicals like the Midget and the Conservator, or publishing church pamphlets like Scenes in the Church Commission, they launched the Dayton imprint Wright Brothers Job Printers out of their home on 7 Hawthorne Street. By 1889, Overall decided that more than school, he wanted to be in the printing business. He began on March 1st, 1889 to publish the West Side News, one year after he constructed a large press to handle complex demanding paper jobs. Geared for the West Dayton community, the weekly paper ran for a mere 13 months, but Orville demanded, committed, remained committed to newspaper publishing. The paper was intended to function as the keystone of a small printing enterprise producing enough income to justify his decision to quit school, forego college, and devote all his time to publishing. To Orville, classroom education was a distraction. The motto of, the motto of his newspaper, The Evening Item, which appeared less than a month after its predecessor, The West Side News, was that it would print all the news of the world that most people cared to read, and in such shape, people, such shape that people would have time to read it. It would also cultivate the clearest and most accurate possible understanding of what is happening in the world from day to day, it wrote. Despite its admirable mission, the evening item died even faster than the West Side News, lasting only four months. The evening item closed down in August 1890, unable to hold its own among the Dayton competition, which included more than 10 papers. With the rebirth of the family printing business as right and right. Orville's new operation would, could serve Dayton businesses seeking to publish directories, reports, programs, posters, advertising cards, and letterhead. The printing office moved a little more than a block away from Hawthorne Street to the corner of Third and William Street. Within the crucible of the publishing world, Orville and Paul linked up. The white printer and the black editor collaborated to publish 
a newspaper for local African-American readers, both dropping out of school in academic year 1889, 1890 to pursue the cause. The Dayton Tadler debuted on December 13, 1890 as the entrepreneurial marriage of, of Paul and Orville. The publishing house of Wright and Wright and the editorship of the Dayton Tadler Company, which Paul founded to certify the Dayton Tadler as a commercial business, joined forces to produce what he thought would be the first of many issues of a weekly newspaper appearing on Saturdays, each unfurling across four broadsheet pages in bright and newsy fashion, as he first gleefully said after initial local reviews of the first issue came in. Paul rightly recognized that circulating the Tatler only on Saturdays enabled him to cast it as a weekend paper. But by the, by the turn of the century, the weekend was the most lucrative time for a newspaper, especially those affiliated with dailies could hit the, and could hit the stands. Paul was riding that wave. In the first issue, Paul listed himself as an editor. In the second issue, the mass had also included an associate editor chief and assistant business managers and local reporters. Along with the public appeal, good live agents wanted in surrounding towns. The address provided for all communications was Paul Dornbar at number nine West 2nd Street. The Tatler was the quintessential startup paper. Throughout its pages, readers encountered direct appeals for subscriptions, which in standard fashion offered a discount for longer periods. The newsstand price was five cents per issue. A one year annual subscription paid in advance cost $1.50. Rates in the second issue of the Tatler offered a three month subscription for 50 cents and a six month subscription for 75 cents. Plastered across the right side of the first page was an impressive slew of advertising from local businesses, merchant tailors and closers, a jeweler, a carpet cleaner, a furnisher, a grocer, a restaurants and confectioners, a, a millinery, a cigar and tobacco house, an artisanal repairman, a pharmacy, a handyman, a shaving parlor. The paper had the feel of a publication monthly by, about, and for the local communities of Ohio. Indeed, the Dayton Tatler appealed to an audience within and beyond Dayton. In the first two issues published on December 13th and the 20th, were lengthy columns about marriages, holiday festivities, and the Baptist and Methodist churches of Cincinnati. Stories about the strange and the obscure were excerpted from other newspapers around the country. The comical tone of the humorous section and the remarkable tales of oddities in items of interest blurred the line between objective reporting and tongue-in-cheek entertainment. Readers might have faced difficulty taking seriously the news that, quote, Dayton is not the most cosmopolitan of American cities, but other, but, but the other day, a Hebrew, Arab, and an African Negro were arraigned in court on the complaint of a Chinaman, close quote. Or they might have been unsettled by an ironic view of an ethical quandary affecting one of the city, one city's legal system, quote, in the late trial of Binghamton, New York, every juror on the panel who claimed not to have read the case was challenged off, leaving 12 men who had read and discussed it and court lawyers and, public, and the public are agreed that it was one of the fairest verdicts ever rendered by a jury, close quote. These stories along with brief essays on the likes of Negro superstitions showed Paul's interest in delivering important news as well as light entertainment to African-American readers. The Tatler was yet another periodical in the great milieu of newspaper publishing, or what the editor of the journalist of New York Weekly called in 1889, the media's relentless devotion to the interests of everything under the heavens. The United States had more than 13,000 weekly newspapers in circulation by 1899, even if, as the editor wrote, by far the greater number either fail or ruined their proprietors. Demand was great for the news. Doors to editorial desks and publishing houses were open to those creative enough to funnel the news to the masses, as it were, especially to urbanites to whom newspapers were a necessary part of weekly life. Paul appealed to this urban base of readers by focusing on Dayton news in the regular Tatler column, City Items. 
Here was a record of events, memorial services, children's activities, and incidents of crime. There were also personalized news from the trivial to the bizarre. And then there was encouragement for readers to patronize local businesses, echoing the advertisements that they had likely encountered on page one. If the Dayton Tatler showcased Paul's entrepreneurial instincts and editorial expertise, it also revealed for the first time his complex, his complex stance on race. In an editorial he wrote in the first issue, he stated that the periodical above all catered to and sought to cultivate further an African-American readership, which has for a long time demanded a paper representative of the energy and enterprise of our citizens, he wrote. The Tatler had two models. On the one hand, it gives all the news among the colored people. And on the other, the Tatler should go into every family of our race in the state. But its mission went beyond merely delivering the news. It sought to contribute to the economic, artistic, and political well-being of the race. Quote, to encourage and assist the enterprises of the city, to give our young people a field in which to exercise their literary talents, to champion the cause of right, and to espouse the principles of honest Republican, Dunbar wrote. Just as remarkably, Paul envisioned the Tatler as an informational bulwark against financial corruption and politics as a means of rescuing, as he put it, the hearts of our colored voters and snatch them from the brink of that yawning chasm, paid democracy, close quote. For the paper to survive and fulfill these goals, readers had to, had to give back in at least one of three ways, pay for subscription, pay to advertise on its pages, or submit a piece of writing. Yet Paul's desire to enlighten and uplift colored readers was separate from his desire to fill the tablet solely with political opinions about race, as you can see in this block quote here. At 18, Paul had little experience in the world of the world, and his mostly peaceful encounters with whites in Dayton could partly explain his erasure of the race problem from the pages of the Tatler but a profoundly racial design betrayed his editorial bluster. He wanted to educate his readers to vote with a mind immune to financial corruption, even as he sought to downplay the activism of the written word. He planned to create more space in the Tatler for other things than this one question to talk about, that is the race question. His collection of local and national news of both serious and silly types sought to do just that. Still, Paul's call for readers to agitate in public instead of in print affiliated the Dayton Tadler with a story tradition of African-American culture. Newspapers issued by and for African-Americans numbered in the hundreds in the 1890s, according to one historian, but the number of magazines in any considerable circulation in life and life of more than a year or two was very small. The Dayton Tadler predated by a decade the Boston-based Colored American Magazine, whose editor, editor Walter Wallace declared in the first issue in 1900 that, quote, American citizens of color have long realized that there exists no monthly magazine distinctively devoted to their interests and to the development of Afro-American art and literature, close quote. The Tatler highlighted neither the former nor perhaps the latter. The poems and short stories Paul published turned out not necessarily to be Afro-American in genre. They did not explicitly communicate such interests, including the ability of African-Americans to cope with and correct the electoral and violent repercussions of Reconstruction. The 19th century Black press included many that promoted such interests. The abolitionism of Freedom's Journal, National Reformer, Colored American Magazine prior to the Boston version, Mirror of Liberty and Douglas's Monthly in the Antebellum Era. The politically diversified corpus of the Anglo-African Magazine at the outset of the Civil War and the racial pride of the Colored American Magazine, Horizon and Voice of the Negro at the turn of the 20th century. If he could last long enough, the Tatla could forge a new path to give the, all the news among the colored people of Dayton, it said even while subordinating horrific news about race relations to humorous views about social relations. But even its appeal to potential African-American writers, quote, to give us a variety and cease feeding on your weary readers on an unbroken diet 
of the race problem, close quote, was in itself a commentary on the rhetorical narrowness of racial politics in America. If the race question received little attention in the essays of on local and national news in the Dayton Tatler. It enjoyed even less in the poems, short stories, and drama published in the newspaper. Paul wielded a heavy editorial hand in crafting the mission and structure of the paper. His brief salutary essays apprised readers of the state of the Tatler, of the likely changes to its news coverage, of the local reaction to its emergence, of the promise of excellence and entertainment it aspired to fulfill. Yet he controlled the nature of the literature itself, too. He wrote the majority of it. The Tatler received acclaim from what Paul called two leading newspapers, the Journal and Evening Herald. Quoted in the second Tatler issue, the Journal remarked that the Dayton Tatler Company was, quote, an organ representative of the colored population of this city and its political spirit of republicanism and its proposed good works should be encouraged. Likewise, the Evening Herald hailed the first number of the Tatler as a bright and newsy issue. Accolades in fellow city newspapers, however, were not enough to keep the Tatler afloat. The final issue appeared in December 27th uh, of 1890. Looking back, Orville noted, quote, we published it as long as our financial resources permitted of it, which was not for long. It was three weeks to be exact. Neither Paul nor Orville could generate enough funds to overcome financial woes. Paul also was not willing to sacrifice his formal education without a worthwhile entrepreneurial opportunity at the level of establishing a newspaper. Orville did find in the Tadler for his own scientific curiosity. In the Tadler's final issue, Paul saw fit to include a small essay, as you can see here, Airship soon to fly. Inventor E.J. Pennington had announced to the stockholders at a Chicago meeting of the Mark Mount Carmel Aeronautic Navigation Company that, quote, we will sail into Chicago in the first of our airships, close quote. Paul agreed with his printers, the Wright brothers, that a story about the potential, quote, manufacturer of ships for traveling in the air, close quote, was news fit to print in a colored newspaper. Despite being buried in an issue of a newspaper on the verge of death, this story was one of the earliest seeds of evidence that Orville and Wilbur were conceiving of an inventing the airplane, indeed in an African-American newspaper of Dayton, Ohio. The three issues of Tatler represented neither the first nor the last time uh, and place Paul published his creative writing during his years at Central High School for an audience wider than the high school times. At the end of his sophomore year, a couple of weeks before his 16th birthday, he published his first individual poems, Our Martyred Soldiers and On the River in the June 8th and 13th issues of the Dayton Herald. Almost two years later for the final issue of West Side News or on April 5th, 1890, a local periodical Orwell was editing around the same time, Paul published most notably a poem called The West Side News. Before, before Paul worked for the Tadler, he was already a prolific author of poems, but also one who sought to circulate his work among a range of intramural and city papers and to speak to an ever-growing community of readers. But the creative writing Paul published in the Tatler was as serious as the work that appeared in other publications, if not more so, because it represented the kind of poetry and fiction and drama that he wanted to read in a newspaper for colored people of Dayton. What we find is a motley literary assortment. The most distinctive poem Paul likely wrote was Lager Beer, credited to the unknown Fenberger Dutzelheim, a name that contains the anagram Paul Dunbar. This is the earliest published example of his dialect poetry and gestures to the sizable German community in Dayton. On a deeper psychological level, the poem's emphasis on how inebriated misbehavior leads to conviction, incarceration, and the dissolution of family recalls the tortured story of alcoholism that beset Joshua Dunbar and would later afflict Paul too.
Paul's lengthiest piece is The Gambler's Wife, a work of drama serialized across three, all three issues, but uncompleted, closing with To Be Continued, according to the Tatler's final issue. He understood, as fellow American writers of this time did, the lucrative potential of serializing long-form fiction. In serialization, Paul could have the best of both worlds. He could publish his fiction in serial format and imagine a future in which his work would thereby become available for an increasingly literate audience, which could afford periodicals. Later on, he would also consider combining such serialized works into a book for whose readers, for those readers who wish to read the entire consolidated text at one time. After the demise of the Dayton Tatler, Paul returned to Central High School, which permitted him to graduate in 1891, a year later than expected. He completed his final semester there in spring of 1891 as an exceptional, although not officially an honor student. Aside from his, an improvement in his grades and deportment, a great a range of successes and failures had deepened his experience of the world and made him wiser as he entered manhood, as they say. By mid-spring, his graduation and 19th birthday around the corner, he felt the weight of the future, his mind vacillating between ideas, quote, some new weight, some soon or late, on my soul to bind, crushing all its courage out, heavier than doubt, and on the other hand, quote, the world we fear no more as here we stand upon the shore, prepared to cast our moorings free and breast the waves of future's sea. These lines appear in the last two poems of significance Paul published as a high school student. The first set of lines are from Melancholia, which he placed in the high school times in a spot long reserved for him if he wished, thanks to his past editorial service. The emotional, <clears throat> the emotional beauty and centered gravity of thinking things unknown and awful. Thoughts on wild uncanny themes is a far cry from the technical infelicities that and convoluted moral and social humor of his Tatler writings. Melancholia illustrates specters with the graceful touch of softened meter with a delicate balance of middle and end rhymes, assonance and alliteration. On Tuesday, June 16th, 1891, the temperature in Dayton reached the high 80s, but the air felt even hotter than that with high humidity. Under these sweltering conditions, the commencement exercises of Central High School took place in the majestic Grand Opera House near the corner of North Main Street and East First Street. If Paul continued to brood in private, he ensured that melancholia did not infiltrate the words he wrote for faculty, staff, and fellow classmates on graduation day, which occurred 11 days before his 19th birthday. Orville was not listed since he dropped out of high school after the Tatler folded. Thoroughly musical, commencement was a long ceremony with school anthems, religious and choral, and a song performed by a trio of young ladies of graduating class. It featured many speeches, the typical salutary and valedictory speeches, but also 10 essays read by graduating students, plus an extended oration by a student graduating with special honors, bestowed on only 10 others as well. The penultimate part was a distribution of diplomas to all 43 graduating students. As long as the ceremony was, it gave Paul, the sole African-American student, the last word. Transcribed in the program was a poem, a farewell song. He, can, he wrote it especially for the occasion. None of the other five songs recited during the event were printed in the keepsake program. What a fascinating scene in the heart of a city, in the Southern region of a state whose schools were only recently desegregated by race, where black and white students could at, le at last learn together, where Paul and Orville could collaborate as partners in a business, and where finally, before the president of the Dayton Board of Education and the principal of Central High School, a young man of once enslaved parents could sing among his white peers who would accept, if not his, embrace his very words. In these words, 
a young writer wrestled with the preconceptions of what the future had in store for him. Whereas Melancholia addressed solitary anxiety in Farewell Song, he announced, like Robinson Crusoe, or the protagonist of his favorite childhood novel, a personal transcendence from parental grip. Whereas the ghastly and ghostly images of the unknown haunted him before, now he stood unfrightened, ready to welcome a new world. Spiritual paralysis gave way to a hope whose energies drew upon a restive imagination, a maturation of what it meant to say farewell, farewell to the past. Here I read the last three verses to close my lecture. The wind is fair, the sails are spread. Let hearts be firm, Godspeed is said. Before us lies the untried way and we're impatient at the stay. At last we move how thrills the heart, so impatient for the start. Now up over hill and down through Dell, the echo brings our song, Farewell. The breezes take it up and bear the loud refrain on wings of air, and to the skies the sad notes swell of this our last farewell, farewell. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Man, that was smoking. That was great. Robin, um, first of all, Abby, thank you so much for welcoming everyone and that wonderful introduction to Robin. And then Robin, for your marvelous introduction of my dear friend, Jean. Uh, Robin, why don't you start us off, if you would be so kind? I can certainly start us off unless you'd like to take the first question. Me? First yeah. question? Never. <laughs> <laughs> After you, dear. All right, all right, then I will. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Jean. This was this was stunning and amazing and eye-opening, and I learned so much. I will never look at Paul Lawrence Dunbar the same way again. So thank you so much, and I cannot wait to read your book. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but my first one uh, really pertains to the, the, the conundrum of doing biography. Uh, when one writes biography, it always raises the question of, what one subject would have to say about the biography, especially if the subject is deceased. So I would like to know um, what you think Paul Lawrence Dunbar would most appreciate about your book and also what he might least appreciate about your book. That's, that's a, a great that's question. A, that's a great question. Well, first of all, you know, the art of biography, especially when you have access to personal letters of Con, uh, correspondence can be revealing. And certainly when you're writing letters of correspondence to someone, you're not expecting necessarily that it would be published, these letters would be published widely. And so the very premise of certain kinds of biographies, particularly the more intimate ones, reveal an aspect of someone's life that they may not have initially intended to be public. And so certainly the challenge of writing a biography is how very much to not only account for the public image, the public representation of a figure, but also the private ruminations, the private representations, either to oneself through letters or through diaries or to, to others. And so when I think of someone like, so if you think about that in the abstract, one thing that um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar might appreciate about this book is that it, it discloses his deep-seated cr critique of how he was being pigeonholed in the American literary marketplace, that he had to write a certain kind of literature according to certain stereotypes. So I think that full story is revealed uh, to the world. And it also indicates how much it vexed him uh, as, a, as a writer and as a thinker. I think certainly on the other hand, the thing that he might be, he would be concerned about was how I also reveal the extent to which um, he was profoundly uh, conflicted um, about these issues and how he might have spoke ill of others who we tried to keep some of his uh, this information away from. So he was quite critical of those who praised him as a dialect poet, but in person, he very much um, admired these people and he um, enjoyed 
their uh, patronage. Uh, I, I should also say that you know part of this biography in particular reveals how he he and uh, Alice, when they were married, they had a rather tempestuous relationship. It was one that was emotionally unstable and physically uh, unstable. And I'm sure that in the way in which he was concerned about racial uplift and presenting his best foot forward, that this biography would reveal that particular aspect of his life that he would probably prefer to keep private. Well, that's a fabulous question. Um, <clears throat> Gene, when I was growing up, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the poet laureate of the uh, African American people. You know, I mean, it, we talk about Langston Hughes being the uh, poet laureate. That was of the next generation. The my father's generation, they could recite Paul Lawrence Dunbar all day long, and the reason is they had to memorize Paul Lawrence Dunbar in the colored schools. You know, under segregation. And people loved Paul Lawrence Dunbar. My, as you know, my mentor at Yale, uh, Charles Davis, was the first African American to get tenure in the English department. He, you can ask Kimberly Benston or um, um, Errol McDonald at, at Random House, um, and a couple other uh, people who were uh, well known scholars. We all took his graduate seminar in uh, January, that semester of 1976 at Yale. He would read, I mean, he liked Douglas, da da da, Du Bois, but when he read Paul Lawrence Dunbar, man, he was, he was on the plantation. He was like, you could hear Melindy sing. <laughs> Shut your mouth, hush your mouth. I mean, you could tell there was a whole cultural experience that, and he just smiled and he loved it. And he was such a proper man. You could never, I never even knew how to uh, read Dunbar out loud because you have to hear that particular, there's not one black dialect, quote unquote. And, and he had this Ohio, a regional black dialect thing going on, as you say, from Dayton. And so it's hard, it's not like reading Langston Hughes in Harlem or, or something. So my question is, what happened to Paul Ernest Dunbar? You know, I tell my students, you think that um, um, writers don't disappear, that they're important forever. Well, hello, 15 years ago, James Baldwin was not the James Baldwin of today. Um, now people were reading him more vividly, more excitement. It's like he'd been recanonized. More graphically, Frederick Douglass was out of print between his death in 1960, when Benjamin Quarles did an edition of um, the narrative of the life published by Harvard. So Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the man for a long time. And then all of a sudden he's not canonized so much anymore. Um, what is your take on that? And will this biography, I always tell my students strong readings to quote Bloom, bring people back, you know, you, you can, I tell my students, you have the power to canonize somebody. If you do a brilliant reading on so, somebody, you can, everybody's talking about them. Everybody, you know, or everybody's reading her again. Um, so will this, by, what, first of all, what happened to it? Secondly, am I wrong that he was read less and canonized less today than he was say 50 years ago? Second, why? Uh, and then third, is this biography gonna bring him back? And fourth and most, Scandalously, Alice Dunbar Nelson, if I'm remembering, writes a note to a friend complaining about one mad night of passion that ruined her life. And that was the night of passion with him. Could you uh, explicate that, uh, Professor? <laughs> Help me to understand to what she was referring. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Skip. And so um, there are many things to touch on. First thing I will say is, uh, and this is actually uh, pertains to the first part of, of your remarks about there is almost a kind of a sing song recitative nature to uh, Dunbar's poetry. You know, he was writing at a time in the late 19th century where there was heavy emphasis, not only on the written word, but the spoken word. And there were a number of writers or poets ranging from Longfellow and Lowell to James Whitcomb Riley. These are kind of American writers who um, were 
performing their poetry and they wrote in a particular kind of way uh, such that you know there were a number of couplets, there were easy uh, uh, end rhymes in their um, verses. These were short pithy verses that could be easily remembered and they belonged to a genre was called fireside or school schoolroom poets. So these were the kinds of poems that even children could memorize in classrooms and recite or these were the kinds of nostalgic or sentimental poems that you could read by the fireplace. And so uh, Dunbar had adopted some of these forms and he often called his own poems lyrics in his private correspondence with others. And so there is very and in much- a, And in a sight of lyrics of lowly life, right? That's right. In a number of the titles of his books, you see the word lyrics. And so what you find is that he placed a key emphasis on the recitative nature of his poem from a formal standpoint. So I just wanted to touch on that. Um, the next thing is what happened to Dunbar's uh, lex legacy? You have to remember that by the time Dunbar died in 1906, there's this later movement, as you know, called the ne New Negro Renaissance in Harlem, or in short, the Harlem Renaissance, that had a number of arbiters or architects. In this particular arena of African-American poetics, you had James Weldon Johnson, who was trying to characterize the kind of vernacular poetics of African-American uh, literature. And it was through that kind of uh, paradigm shift that there was some kind of critique of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the extent to which Dunbar was more beholden to minstrel sentimentality as opposed to being really forward looking and providing a quote unquote authentic kind of voice in the new mold of Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. And so what I would say is that the appreciation of Dunbar um, entered some kind of um, friction through the period of the Harlem Renaissance and also through uh, the 20th century. We do find some kind of resuscitation of interest in Dunbar once you get to the 1960s and 1970s. That was a time of the uh, great canonization of African-American literature with the founding of Black Studies programs. And you found the creation, the essays and the edited books on Paul Lawrence Dunbar, forcing us to rethink his poetry. What I do find now at the turn into the 21st century is that many people have now understood the deep formal and thematic complexity of his writings. I do think that to a degree, he has been published either in anthologies of American literature broadly or in African American literature in particular. What I would hope that my biography is able to do is to deepen everyone's understanding of the intellectual and cultural context in which these poems were born, but also the various challenges that he faced as an individual as he was writing these poems. And what you find is that he is path breaking. He creates a, a wonderful world as, the, as a, a child of former slaves. And so he was really kind of plowing, quote unquote, plowing the driveway for a lot of writers of his generation and there are a number of scars on his legacy as a result, but I would like to think that there were lessons learned for many um, writers who came in his wake. The last thing I'll say regarding uh, Alice is that very much they had a combustible marriage. There was an episode uh, uh, right at, at the moment that precipitated their breakup when they had a, a great physical conflict and Dunbar had written a letter to Alice, essentially evicting her from uh, their residence. It was such a widespread story that even Booker T. Washington and his closest aide were talking about this that had a ripple effect through the Washington DC uh, intelligentsia. And so there've been a variety of characterizations of this event. And I guess for greater details about this, you'll have to read the biography. But I will say that one thing that I hope to stress is that Alice, Alice herself is a remarkable woman and she was remarkably accomplished. And it's almost unfortunate that she, her legacy has existed within the shadow of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's you know, excellence as a poet and his impact. But what I find of late, especially with the scholarship of, of um, Professor Wall, she's someone who had, had um, 
who had looked at um, uh, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's work is how Alice herself was extremely prolific. Even during the era of the Harlem Renaissance, she was uh, productive. She was an, an editor of a, of, of a black journal and she has her own life to tell. And so my hope is that my biography will stimulate interest not only in him, but in her as well. Oh, that's great. Um, Matt, can you, yeah, I want Robin, I don't want Robin in the shadow. She's uh, turned her back off, thank you. Um, uh, John Stauffer um, is very, very interested in uh, Gene in your work and, and in Dunbar. And uh, I know he has a question. And then we want you to be Mark Patterson, who is of course the queen of the new Negro trope. <laughs> and just so everyone knows, um, Gene and I did a, an anthology called uh, basically on the new Negro, the new Negro, and we're doing a massive new edition um, with a principle we'd be publishing with Martha Patterson, who has just um, done more to unearth the trope of the new Negro than I ever dreamed. Martha finds new Negro under every uh, stone <laughs> between 1895 and 1930. So um, whoever we can see first, uh, Martha, you want to ask a question? And I'll then just, I'll just I'm jump sorry. in for a minute. I think John Stauffer had to leave, I think, unfortunately, Gene. So he was really happy to be here, but I, it looked like he had to leave. Um, oh, OK. So if he comes back, we'll bring him on. But for now, we have Martha right here. Hi, Martha. Hi. Hey, Martha. Hi, Gene. I want to thank you. This is so interesting. And um, I, have a, I have a bunch of things. I'll limit it to three questions that are kind of interrelated. And um, I'm really interested in the newspaper context that you talked about. And I, so the first question is just kind of um, a, I, I'm just curious about how, did Dunbar see himself as, as a part of the, the new Negro journalists that, that were actually you know, pretty politically, um, active and you know did he see himself was he you know was the was his paper using material from the Washington Bee from the New York Freeman from uh from John Mitchell's uh paper the Richmond Planet I mean did he see himself as part of that new Negro conception of the activist black journalist uh during that period um so that's that's the first question and then you mean you mean at the turn of the century? I'm talking about in the 1890s. Yeah, in 1890. Yeah, so the first himself, the first iteration the of the first new iteration, new. right? Right. So that's the first question. The other thing that was really interesting to me is the way in which this this connection to Orville Wright and the thinking of kind of newness in in technology. And I, you know, in kind of here you are. You know, here he is uh, tied to you know one of the foremost inventors um, of the new era, right? And so I'm just curious: do you see that kind of um, do you see him using new rhetoric or tying a um, you know aff affiliating African Americans with the new era of technology, technological development that they are um, uh, their uh, intellectual growth. Uh, after Reconstruction is all part of that larger, um, this larger excitement of the new age and, the, uh, and, and all the, you know, the, all the excitement of the dynamo, right? You know, if you're thinking about John Adams' essay, I mean, is, do you see him doing that? Um, so those are the, those are the two, um, the, the third, third question I'll just say is, I'm just curious, and this is just a kind of personal curiosity is, did you find any reference where he has, talked about himself as a new Negro. I mean, he's referred to as a new Negro, um, certainly in the white press uh, and in the black press, right? But in the white press really early on. And I'm just curious if you, you know, did he ever reflect on that? You know, did he, um, uh, you know, how did he, did he see himself uh, in that vein? So sorry, sorry about the three questions. But. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, and so the first question was about to what extent did Dunbar view his paper as part of this kind of broader uh, enterprise of new Negro, let's say, periodical uh, publication. You know, the thing I think that's important to, to understand was as Dunbar was growing up, I would like to say that he didn't view himself yet fully as this kind of nationwide poet. 
he was very much tied to the Midwest. Uh, there was the Western Association of Writers. That was a conference that passed through and he profoundly affiliated himself with particular regional societies and cultures. Even other colleagues uh, at that time, such as William Howells or James Whitcomb Riley, even if you think about Charles Chestnut, although today he's canonized uh, in a different way, they very much were regional writers. And so when you think about how he styled the Dayton Tadler, it was the name Dayton is prominent and Tadler was kind of represents a lightness a lightness of conversation. And so it wasn't seeking as much to uh, make, if you will, grand statements about the emergence of African-Americans into modernity as opposed to some of the other African-American newspapers that I had referenced uh, in my talk that were based up in the Northeast um, corridor. And, and since that was the case, Unlike, uh, let's say, some of these Northeastern African-American newspapers that would funnel national news into their particular issues, it tended to the Dayton Tadler to republish local news. And so it went as far as Detroit. Uh, it's perhaps went at times as far as New York City, but it didn't pretend to go farther in that. And so it truly does, it truly did relish being a kind of a a, 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 a portal to what was going on in the local Dayton community. The second thing that you point out is regarding Orville Wright vis-a-vis -vis technology and um, this kind of new age. I think that's a really fascinating point. I think I'll actually combine that with the, sec with the, with the third question about to what extent did Dunbar refer to himself as a new Negro. I think, you know, when I think about the new Negro, that is a, that's an explicit terminology but there are many permutations discursively uh, around New Negro. So African-Americans in the late 19th century viewed themselves as pivoting to a new century. And so you find African-Americans situating themselves as emblems of a kind of a racial and cultural modernity. There are various tropes and discourses embedded in the idea of modernity that sometimes employ the language of New Negro and sometimes do not. And so I'm sure if I did a new a, a word search, I, I would see whether or not he employed the term um, New Negro. I could probably uh, you know, look offline since I've digitized my colleagues and I, uh, Tom Morgan, who is a professor at the University of Dayton, he and I worked to digitize the full correspondence. Um, so I could always let you know on the side, but I would say that yes, there was this kind of way in which Dunbar did think about the new century of African-American intellectual culture. And to what extent was he a vehicle for that? Although the Dayton Tatler itself did not emblematize that widened view, when you take a closer look at Dunbar's letters, when you took, take a closer look at the essays that he published, whether in reference to Frederick Douglass or these recent developments in terms of uh, riots, you know, the Wil Wilmington riots, for example, he does very much touch on what is the place of the quote unquote African-American citizen who is coming out of reconstruction and trying to understand the new world. I should also say finally that you have to remember that um, education for African-Americans was only growing at this time. And so in the 1890, 1890s, you find a codification of liberal arts education in secondary schools and Dunbar was part of that. And you also had some writers or intellectuals such as um, you know, uh, Pauline Hopkins or Scarborough, people who were talking, talking about class, the, the classics or classical history that African-Americans can engage with and how that was a medium for them to understand the existence um, in the, the new century. So since that was the case, you, we have to think about how Dunbar was representing this kind of wide, broad scale, formal literacy in the classroom that was being sanctioned by, you know, local and, and state governments on the heels of de racial desegregation. And so if you want to characterize an imagination of the new century, you can almost connect it to this kind of uh, epistemology of formal education that was growing in the last decade of the, of the 19th century, particularly for African-Americans coming out of uh, slavery. And he, they were also, by calling the Dayton Tatler, they were 
punning on the Tatler from England, right? Gene? Oh, uh, uh, pun on the Tatler. And it, it, there were actually many journals, not only that one, but there were many journals actually in the 19th century that went by the name of uh, Tatler. Um, it was a uh, it was a point of uh, of jest for for readers. It was all, it was a rather humorous periodical, I must say. I probably did not evince very well how funny some of the episodes are, and I cut some parts out. But it's actually a, a, a really entertaining uh, series of publications. Oh, great! Um, I was re I was referring to the 1709 edition, of course. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Abby. Are you curating questions? I am, or? I am. So that was, Jean, thank you so much. It's so, we already said how nice it was to see each other again. And I will repeat that. Um, a couple of things, we have quite a few questions that I'm going to group together, but I wanted to point out that Tom Morgan isn't who you just referenced is in the audience. And I noticed quite a few names um, from University of Dayton, which I, when I was doing a little research, um, I discovered this world of Dunbar scholarship that I did not know about. So that, that's that been really enjoyable for me. And I wanted to thank our friends from Dayton for being here. Um, that's one of the things that's so nice about this. While we miss being in person, having this done virtually means that we can gather people who we wouldn't normally gather. So, um, so thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> these questions, one question, I'm going to take a little privilege to ask my own question that I just noticed from the end, and it connects back to what you were ju just saying about formal education. I noticed on the list of graduates in Paul Dunbar's class that there, I think, were more girls' names than boys' names, yeah, or young women and young men. But in the picture, he's that you, the few pictures that you showed, he was shown with just the, um, you know, the male, other male students. So I'm just wondering about that. Is that something pointed that there were more um, young women than young men in his graduating class? Would that have been typical of this time? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. I'm not sure if I can extrapolate that, but I think that's a very good observation in looking at the difference. That picture of uh, Dunbar beside Orville in that group, that was when he was part of the class of 1890. And so that was a different uh, graduating class as opposed to the graduating class that you see in the write out of the okay. commencement, which was um, you know, class of, of 1891. Um, I, I, you know, but I, but I think that's a, that's a fair point. It'd be interesting to think about if, if the proportion uh, mm -hmm. is quite um, uh, significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That was just a very quick question that I had. Um, we have, as I said, I'm trying to group the questions and some of these will expand, ask you to expand on some of what's already come up in the Q&A, but so I hope that's okay. Um, Carrie Greenidge is here. And she asks, in what way do you see Dunbar in conversation with contemporaries like Charles W. Chestnut and Pauline Hopkins? Was he a role model to them in the vein of Langston Hughes and fellow new Negro writers from the 20s? Or was he seen as a controversial right, rival slash voice a la Richard Wright in the 40s? Congratulations on the book. Can't wait to see it. So. Thanks. Well, asking all, what the conversation, what, how is he in conversation with these other writers or how is his work in conversation with them? Thanks for the uh, question from uh, uh, Professor Kerry Greenidge who uh, has done outstanding work in the conference. It's wonderful to, to get a question from her. Um, and so I think the fascinating thing that I found uh, regarding Dunbar's relationship to Chestnut, I think many people do view them as contemporaries in the sense that they both published around the same time. They both had a kind of triangular relationship if you include Howells. It's also the case that they grappled with the specter, the commercial specter mm -hmm. of dialect in literature. What, you, what many people do not know, something I talk about in the book, is how there were private conversations between Dunbar and Alice about Chestnut. And there was actually a deep competitiveness that Dunbar had about the kind of success that uh, Chestnut had, particularly in the form of fiction. And so remember that Dunbar himself was uh, excelling as a poet, although he did publish books of short fiction as well as 
novels. Uh, and he also wrote the long form essay, but he was known especially as a poet, whereas Chestnut himself was thriving in the, well, in the, in the realm of short fiction and, and the novel. And so one thing that, that Dunbar was trying to think about was how, to what extent did Charles Chestnut occupy a space in the commercial marketplace that competed with his own? And I think that's a, it, it's a fascinating way to, to think about how, you know, you, you know, when we think about these time periods, looking at the exchanges of ideas that they have either about racial uplift or about regionalism, about matters of lynching, both of them talked about these issues, but there was a very real cognizance of each writer about how they were going to publish their work and to what extent that they were viable. Mm -hmm. And so I, I point out those two very different sides, the kind of the professional size, side, that is how they were emerging in as professional writers or, or earning a living by writing literature, as opposed to on the other hand, how we would think about them today usually is as contemporaries who are uh, kind of grappling with the same set of, um, or similar set of, of intellectual um, issues. I will say that um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar did not strike me as having a profoundly antagonistic relationship with some of the African-American contemporaries of that time. So there are other writers such as Francis Har uh, Harper, there's also Pauline Hopkins, as you know. Um, he very much was, had a kind of a, a grand view of his success. He was traveling abroad and he was connecting with um, uh, the violinist um, uh, 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 Coleridge Taylor. He was thinking about how he was able to build his identity as a professional author. And I, and I don't think that he um, had that kind of relationship. There is also something I should point out is that he died young, he died in his early thirties. Mm -hmm. And so it's the case that if he lived a lot longer, at least 10 or 20 years longer, some of these kinds of relationships that we find in other eras may have become manifest, but he died so young, although he was very prolific, that it kind of skews the emphasis that you would place in uh, presenting a rendition of his life. Yeah, I well, was actually, then, oh, go ahead, Skip, sorry. Oh, um, I'm interrupting you, Abby. Oh. oh, I was just going to say that it seemed, I was actually going to ask you if I heard correctly that he had died in 1906, because that, he died so young. So looking at his years and Chestnut's years, for instance, Chestnut kind of subsumes his, his lifespan in a way, which does, you know, certainly have an effect on, on how they can be but put into you, conversation as writers. But if you think about the rate of his publication, by the time he um, reached, uh, so he had published in his first uh, five years, you know, seven different books. Over the next three years, he published eight books. And then the following set of years, um, really the prime of his time between um, 1893 to 1906, uh, he was remarkably prolific. And also in a, in a career that included a, a host of these books, uh, he published close to 700 poems across bo these books of poetry. And a lot of these poems were published individually and syndicated. So he was really cranking these works out. And, you know, today we have a view of him as a kind of, um, as a, a, a kind of an elegant poet, but even someone as remarkable as Henry James, if you look at his letters, he was talking with his brother, uh, William, about how he had to crank out these stories in order to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. Although today he was such an exceptional writer that we would elevate to these to a particular canon of American literature. And so it's fascinating when you take a closer look, how much pressure he was on in order to um, make ends meet. Mm -hmm. The, um, Chestnut and Dunbar also had Ohio in common, which couldn't have helped um, <laughs> in terms of the sense of rivalry. And one was very light, light enough to pass. Uh, and the other one, well, I'm, I remember in that infamous um, uh, preface that um, um, William Dean Howes did. I mean, he talks about that he was a pure Negro you know, that he was a pure African. And he even says he would be worth something under the hammer. How much money? He said a generation before Dunbar would be worth X amount of dollars. I mean, it's scandalous, mm -hmm. but yes. 
Yes, that's right. You know, on a couple of occasions, on, on the one hand, uh, William Howells wrote a, a review in 1896 of uh, Dunbar's book, Majors and Minors. It appeared in Harper's Weekly in the same issue in which they were talking about the presidential election. And it turned out to be one of the most, one of the best-selling issues of Harper's Weekly. And in, in a way, uh, Dunbar's fame rode the crest of that increased attention on that uh, uh, issue. And in there, uh, Howells talks about the very authenticity of Dunbar. There was a way in which uh, the fact that Dunbar, um, by his own uh, recognition and also according to the statements of fellow critics, that he was remarkable, he was darker skinned than Chestnut. And as a result, he, there was assigned to him this kind of discourse of racial authenticity and that he proved that someone could be of almost quote unquote holy African descent and achieve intellectual uh, um, uh, acclaim. There's a profoundly, you know, uh, you know, white supremacist logic there such that, you know, there's almost a kind of a disbelief that someone who could be dark skinned and wholly of African descent could achieve such intellectual renown. Um, so there's a problem with that kind of logic. But the point I'm making is that that was very much the distinction between Dunbar and, and Chesson at that time. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, in 1896, the Plessy v. Ferguson, it's the height of the rollback to Reconstruction and all kind of lunatic theories about race and race mixture. So how's in one sense, I mean, we read it, it seems ridiculous and racist. But on the other hand, it's pushing back against these equally racist notions that, you know, only mixed race black people had any kind of um, native uh, intellectual ability. The other quick point is that uh, five years later, William Stanley Braithwaite is hailing um, the first renaissance in African-American uh, literature. And he says it is the, uh, the sign of the renaissance uh, is the work of three writers. Paul Ernst Lumbar, Charles Chestnut, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and that's in 1901. So he and Chestnut are being grouped together, whether they liked it or not, right? I mean, and it was a kind of moment for the race at the, with the, you know, in this period of the first iteration of the new Negro, who is she, you know, who, who is he, who is she, of what does, how is that defined? Will it be defined in literature? Okay, then who? Well, then there's Dunbar, there's Chestnut, and then there's Du Bois, which is uh, also fascinating too. Abby, please continue. Yeah, so Jean, go ahead. On that, just very quickly, I think you're right. I think that it's important always to stress that as Hazel Carby has shown in her work and many uh, scholars, that there was a great prolific uh, period in the 1890s of African-American women. And so they very much, were highly productive during that time. There is a question about the extent to which they were achieving currency in some of the, what we would call mainstream American periodicals. And so there was a way in which the achievements of Dunbar and Chestnut can distort actually the full range of productivity that was happening in the African-American community. The second thing I'll point out is that as Howells was describing Dunbar in this way regarding racial authenticity, there was this kind of uh, remarkable energy in eugenicist discourse and the whole discourse of blood, racial blood. And it was almost in the air. And so you can find not only in Howells, but Howells was kind of symptomatic of this broader trend in American you know, popular culture and intellectual culture about how do you I, understand intelligence um, in or literary intelligence, for example, with respect to racial blood. And so I think you, you see a snapshot of that in his uh, reading and praise of Dunbar. Mm -hmm. So that actually leads into um, the a few questions that came in about Dunbar's reception in the black community of Dayton or among black readers in Dayton and the black community in general, I guess. Um, Jerry Ward asks, how did black people in Dayton respond to the young Dunbar and were, you know, what was the range of responses? If there was a range um, question about from Claudia Downey, did Dunbar establish or maintain a social life with either the black or white communities in Dayton, or I would say, or both. Um, and another 
attendee is also asking, you know, asking similar questions and, and looking at the, the photo of him as the sole black student um, in, the, in, in that high school graduating class, his writing seems um, directed in some ways toward a black readership. Or, so if you could just talk a little about his reception among black readers and black residents of the area. You know, it's, it's really fascinating when you write a biography because there's the typical way I would interpret this as a kind of a, a literary historian. And then also when you, on the other hand, when you see deeper uh, sets of information. So on the one hand, of course, when he achieved great success, when he published Majors and Minors in 1896, a lot of people quoted from Howells's review, not only in the national press, but in local press. And so when you look at publications either in uh, not only in Dayton, but if you look at nearby cities such as, um, you know, Cleveland or Cincinnati, they were talking about him too, and in other parts of the Midwest. And so I think he was very much viewed as this kind of phenomenon. And the discourse around his uh, success more or less was, from, you know, resembled each other. But you find if you take a deeper look, the thing that I love about writing a biography was how did Dunbar himself view this mm -hmm. praise? And so there's this letter by Dunbar to Frederick Douglass. And so Dunbar spent in 1893 time in Chicago uh, during the, um, the World's Exposition where Frederick Douglass was ambassador to Haiti. And he, Frederick Douglass was Dunbar's mentor. And Dunbar would talk to Douglass a lot about the travails of being a writer and they would go back and forth there. So Dunbar would write these letters to Frederick Douglass indicating that as much as people praise him in print, that they deplore his success in private. So he was the prodigal son in Dayton, but he sensed as well a bit of jealousy within the African-American community of mm -hmm. Dayton. So there's almost these two different levels of response, if you will. On the one hand, the kind that we that we find that's legible from a, historic, a historiographical standpoint, but also the part that you find when you look at his private letters to his wife or, or, or his, um, at least at that time, Frederick Douglass, about how he was concerned that the amount of success, the phenomenal stature that he was achieving in Dayton were causing people to view him differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was not able to be a citizen of the community in the same way. And when you think about how, as time goes on, he moves to New York City, he moves to Washington, DC. It, it's almost about the extent to which he's learning more about himself as an individual, kind of the person who uh, grows up and moves on from his own uh, community. And so I would like to say that, yes, it is true that um, there was a celebration of him in Dayton. We celebrate him today, but he had mixed feelings about that. And I do talk about mm -hmm. that in the biography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had, um, you mentioned during the Q&A that the reception of him, and I think this was in response to Skip, a uh, question of Skip's about the critical reception of him, that it, for, you know, it was one thing first and then it moved more toward a distancing because of some, you know, thinking about minstrelsy and that kind, you know, that there was that kind of, uh, I think that's what you had said, like that um, his use of dialect was attributed to a kind of minstrelsy. Um, and so one of our audience members actually asked about that for you to say a little bit more about his use of dialect um, and the culture and, cultural and literary value of that, which I think you have addressed. But how did that play into um, what you've just described as, you know, his own self-conception as a writer or how he viewed himself being read. Yeah, so one thing you notice, I, I showed some passages where you can see the actual dialect. Just to be clear, dialect it, it represents the orthography. It's kind of a literary orthography. It is a transcription of language to represent some kind of informal speech. Mm -hmm. And that representation seeks to characterize a certain group or class of people. This was a genre of writing that was quite popular in the 19th century, particularly among American writers. You think of George Washington Cable, even Mark Twain who wrote Huckleberry Finn, he depended a lot on, on dialect. The thing that Dunbar knew when he worked with dialect is that it 
represented for him a full range of identities. So he was also very much as much a regionalist as he was someone who portrayed African-American communities. And so when he studied the form of writing dialect, he was very much a paying attention to um, you know, a Wiley, who was called a kind of a Hoosier poet of, of Indiana. Now, the fact that, you know, in retrospect, he was writing in dialect, that was consumed by society as something, as approximating some kind of minstrel representation. And by that, I mean, um, it, it, there was a rise of minstrelsy in the antebellum era, also through its vogue in the second half of the 19th century. And dialect was a key linguistic form of that uh, performance culture. And people have argued, such as a uh, scholar, his last name is Wanham, he has revealed that dialect has come to represent some kind of linguistic trope of minstrelsy. So the thing that you can find when you talk about Dunbar is from his vantage point, he mm. would say that dialect represents the diversity of human speech. And there are moments when he's writing in dialect that do not necessarily represent African-American or quote unquote undereducated speech, but it would represent the dialect of, of a certain region of a person from a region. But how people would view that time period today, they would make a distinction between his writing in formal English and his writing in dialect. And some people would argue, and some people did argue during the era of the Harlem Renaissance, that his choice of a vernacular poetics leaned upon some kind of performance of blackness that was not as authentic or wasn't the same kind of likeness that we would find in some of the more progressive kind of vernacular poetics mm -hmm. of let's say Zora, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and Claude McKay, uh, as I mentioned um, before. And so I talk about these issues in the book about how dialect itself was a fraught literary enterprise and it meant different things to different people. Mm -hmm. That's well, Robin, I I you unmuted <laughs> yourself. So I think Robin, our performance professor, wants to <laughs> say something. Oh, I hope I didn't misstep, <laughs> Professor Bruce. No, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not even a little bit. No, my question is about um, overcoming um, a, a student resistance to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. What I've had the experience of, of teaching him in particular in, in, in the context of Indahomey, and it is very hard for students today, undergraduates today, to, to, to engage with dialect as anything other than what they see as internalized racism. And um, I would love to have your advice on how to go in a side door, beside, other than just saying, read Dr. Jarrett's book. Uh, if, if you cannot simply say that, um, what could you say to students to, open their minds a little bit and like, what would be the, the wedge that you would use, the opening wedge to get students who are um, hostile, frankly, to any kind of dialect poetry to, um, to pause and see something beyond what they think they're seeing? That's a, that's a great question. I think it's important, at least in this context, to talk about dialect in the context of, of literature. And so to view dialect as a performance of language, uh, it, is a, it is an example where you have symbolic thickness and it's a place where there are particular formal strategies enacted by the author. And so I've taught dialect a number of times before I would you know, there's an opening scene in Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn where he talks about the full range of dialects uh, available at his disposal and that the reader will encounter these things. That's almost kind of a metacritical or meta literary kind of approach to dialect. And so I think it's important for people to understand that the, that dialect is not per se uh, the utter belief of the author, but it's a kind of literary performance that enables the author to achieve certain goals. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then what are the very goals that the author is trying to achieve? So I think in, with that kind of framing, it broadens the way you think about dialect per se, such that you know, we have a host of quote unquote dialects that you would see on social media. You can just go through social media and people describe things in different ways based on the particular local environments that they're situated or the ways in which they are 
interlinked with various people in their communities. And you would argue that these particular codes, linguistic codes are emblems of certain kind of cultural expressions. And so I would also say with respect to Dunbar that it's a particular kind of code and our job if you're in a class of literature is to decode this mm -hmm. text to understand what his literary strategies and, and goals are. At least that, is, that is so helpful. Thank you so much. And, and one thing you can use, Robin, and, and Jean knows this. Um, I'm, I love, uh, I've written about James Walden Johnson's preface to the Book of American Negro Poetry, 1922, and he says, he denounces dialect. He said, dialect has been so ruined by vaudeville uh, that it has but two stops, uh, and I'm quoting him, humor and, and pathos. Yes. And then in the um, preface to the second edition of the Book of American Negro Poetry, he says, the passing of dialect is now complete. And within a year, he's writing the introduction to Sterling Brown's Southern Road, which is written with a lot of doubt. And he goes, I was wrong. <laughs> Sterling Brown has convinced me that I was wrong about dialect. And here is the proof, the proof in the, the poems that follow. So I think you really have to historicize the poetic exactly. diction. Think of dialect as just one of the poetic dictions, right, Gene? Yes, um, exactly. One of possible poetic diction. But you also have to historicize it. And when Gene talks about Hip hop, I mean, Jesus is like dialect, you know, every every word is in some kind of, you wouldn't use the word dialect now, but a hundred years ago, people would have characterized that mode of poetic diction as, as dialect, but it's a hundred years later and it's completely different and some people like it and some people don't. And some hip hop artists get the Pulitzer Prize, you know, I mean, it's complicated. It's almost like the, the, pile, the politics of poetic discourse Historicized over a century and a, a third almost um, by the, with, between Paul Lawrence Sunbar and today. That's a, a long time, you know, a lot of evolution there. That's a lot of dissident, which is what I call my essay. <laughs> Abby, we got time for it. We got to let this man yes. go and have dinner, but yes. we got time for one more, Gene. One more question, so, just yeah. one more. And this is to, so your, your talk was brilliant and it was structured in talking about Dunbar as a literary figure, but also the business of, of writing and his collaboration with Orville Wright. So um, one of our attendees, Eric Wilson is wondering if he developed any, if Dunbar had any such other such joint promotions or joint ventures with any other Daytonians or otherwise. Hmm. Joint ventures in the sense in the same sense of a commercial. Yeah, uh, I think so. As you know, similar to his his partnership with Orville Wright that you. No, I, I think I think this one is the major one, um, and uh, and remember he was. He was very young. He was only, he was still a teenager, and so there's only so much you can do, especially as an African American boy in the Midwest, right? And, you know, he 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 emerged only right after Jim Crow segregation was being dismantled somewhat, and so the full range of opportunities were limited. And shortly after he finished publishing the Dayton Tatler, he was moving to other cities as he was growing. Uh, in his career. And so this was a kind of um, a, a wonderful moment that captured um, this kind of a synergy between two people who were uh, remarkably different, you know, if, if you take a step back, but they were profoundly um, um, engaged with one another and with this enterprise. And I thought that it, it was a good story to tell. Yeah, very good. And Jewel Harris, another audience member says, she doesn't have a question, but she's excited to see Paul Lawrence Dunbar in the spotlight. So thank you. That seems like the perfect place to end this and to thank you for all that you taught us today. My God. So um, my head is spinning with new information. So thank you so much, Gene. Really appreciate so, it. So the question is, who's going to play Dunbar in the movie, <laughs> in the feature film? <laughs> I, I do have my uh, my ideas, uh, but I'll keep that to myself until I'm well, you, you better tell Oprah. <laughs> Dean, you did a great job. I love you. You know that. You're a great uh, friend, a great collaborator, a great scholar, and a great dean. <laughs> At least that's what they tell me. But I would like to say that I'm honored to be here. I'm glad I had the opportunity to discuss my work. 
And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And, uh, and I really think this is a fantastic opportunity to exchange ideas in the midst of a pandemic. So thank you, Professor Gates, Professor Bernstein, as well as Abby and, and Professor Patterson for having me. And we'll see you at dinner on Martha's Vineyard now that we're vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great job. Great job, Bravo. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Robin. everyone. Thank you, Abby. Very well. Thank you, Martha. Bye-bye.